Hello, the skeptic feminists. We're live! This is Homicidal Harley, and I'm the great Russian Deadpool. Today we are joined by the lovely and brilliant Christy Winters. Again. Hello. Hello. And uh, let's see, we're talking today about wearing random shit on your face that maybe you shouldn't. Uh, specifically the burqa. Yeah. Is it okay to wear the burqa? Uh, or is it maybe uh, extremely impolite to do that in Western societies when women in the East have to wear it and they don't have a choice? So we're talking about that, and uh, it, it does seem to be kind of a feminist issue since there's such a thing as Islamic feminism. And uh, yeah, Christy, why don't you why don't you take it away? Christy, are you still with us? I think we lost. I think Christy. we lost Christy. <laughs> Christy, come back. Uh, the... Christy, we can't hear you. We cannot hear you. All right. Is that any better? Is a, that little, any better? a little. A little. A little bit. Okay. I think it's a stupid uh, word document that I've got open, so I'm going to minimize that. Okay. Um, uh, try so. and copy and paste it over into Notepad. All right. We'll do. Uh, do you, so, do you want to talk about the background of this? Like, we, I had sort of said I was um, in favor. I didn't have a problem with banning the burqa, and you had disagreed, and I know a lot of my liberal friends also disagree. So, do you want to talk a little bit about how we came to discuss this while I copy and paste the document? Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. So, um, I don't, I don't recall our original conversation about it, or maybe you weren't speaking with me. I don't know, but, but um, our general position on it is that it is uh we're all for for freedom of expression so you should be able to wear whatever the fuck you want uh unfortunately that is not the case in uh muslim dominant countries and uh, the ex-muslims and liberal muslims that we speak to frankly find it extremely offensive that westerners and western muslims would choose to wear what they call rape culture on their face when women in the East don't have a way of taking it off without being beaten or executed or whatever. So uh, we're kind of taking our cues from them and we, we included some, uh, some links and sources of people who uh, agree with us on this. And, and uh, we've reached out to our, to our ex-Muslim friends. Unfortunately, most of them, except for Miriam Namazi, who is too busy, uh, are literally in hiding for their lives. So uh, they can't join us for this this discussion that is um, arguably uh, petty compared to what they, they have to go through, which is why we've already done chats on honor violence and things like that. But this, this one is a long time coming. And in feminist circles, there are, there's a, a heated debate about it. And um, uh, it seems like the more liberal and tolerant ones among us seem to be like oh it's their it's their form of expression of of being free or whatever and we find that to be patently garbage but um whether or not it should be banned is a whole other topic so we disagree that the burqa is a form of liberation absolutely uh based on what our muslim friends have told us people who have actually lived under muslim theocracies not just Muslims in the fucking West are like, oh, it's so great here. I choose to express my culture this way. But actual people who have lived under Muslim theocracies, they're like, no, that's fucking garbage. And, and I'm offended that, that so-called allies would, would uh, uh, stand behind this form of subjugation. Right. So how does that sound now? Better. Better. All right. Fantastic. I want to build on that, but first I'm going to take us into a tangent, which is um, just because I, I had a conversation uh, earlier today by email with Philip Moriarty, who has a channel here on YouTube and who has been on my channel. And he is interested in talking to Sargon of Akkad or Carl Benjamin about his petition because um, Philip is an admissions officer. Uh, he works with uh, admissions while also being a professor of physics at his university. And so he has a, um, I'm just going to read it out here. What he's got is, could I set up a discussion slash debate with him, Carl, via a third party channel? I'd really like to focus on the ridiculous petition. Um, low hanging fruit, I know, but I don't believe he's debating it with someone from the STEM side of the disciplinary divide. 
And then he says in parentheses, the, the divide is slowly being broken down, but it's gonna take a generation or two, end parentheses. It would also be good to use a debate of that type to make the case from the STEM perspective of why we need the social sciences and the arts and humanities. So I just wanted to put that out there that um, Philip would really like to have a chat with Carl um, or a debate with him about the petition to the universities and also why he from the STEM side thinks it's valuable to have a variety of courses available at universities. Yeah, and um, this, this involving us in the sense that Philip Moriarty, who we've spoken to on the channel before, uh, has suggested us as a third party to hold this conversation. Um, we've already reached out to Sargon of Akkad and he acknowledged that he is in fact in, in talks with Philip Moriarty and you know, it depends on how the talks go uh, via email, whether or not he'll be willing to have a public debate about it on our channel. That would be pretty cool. We would love to have both of them on to make a debate. Sit up. Our, um, our, our one chat with Philip Moriarty and it unfortunately had to be cut short, if y'all recall, because we, uh, he was sick. Uh, he was feeling under the weather and he was having trouble uh, talking because his throat was so sore. So we'd love to have him on and uh, hear more about him. All right. So with that little side note, now tick that box taken care of. Yeah, I'm going to talk about why in from I'm going to use a feminist critique to explain why I think that well, why I don't have a problem with banning the burqa. And in particular, what I'm thinking about the burqa is the full veil. Um, example here. And I know that as an American with the constitutional protections of freedom of religion, it would be very difficult because of people would claim religious grounds for the burqa, but I'm going to dispute that in my little prepared notes here. Um, I don't think it's ever going to happen in the United States, but my I want to give my perspective about why I don't have a problem with banning the burqa in particular and why I know that I disagree with a lot of my liberal friends on this issue. But I'm, I'm really not here necessarily to change anyone's mind. What I would really am aiming to do by talking to you guys is present what I think is a reasonable and understandable position that even if you don't agree with it, you understand where I'm coming from. So to start the discussion, again, I'm, I'm talking about the burqa that covers the entire head, face, body, and has webbing or grill work over the eyes that allows the wearer basically no peripheral vision. And the reason that I'm fundamentally against it uh, in particular is because I don't think the state has um, any place, well, or an argument could be that the, again, sorry, to say this, to correct myself. People might object to banning the burqa for the following reason, that the government has no place in deciding what a woman can and cannot wear. It's her body. It's not public property. And my objection to the burqa, we really have to go back 6,000 years to where we have the, the seeds of our own civilization, uh, Judeo-Christian and also Muslim civilization. And when at the time the Bible was initially written, the, the Jewish scriptures as we have them today, life was very different. Our social political, religious lives today are separated into different spheres. We consider them very different parts of our lives. Whereas in ancient societies, all of this stuff was mixed. There were no spheres. There was a common structure for power in these societies that were reflected in the religious beliefs as well as the political and military structures of the time. There were in-group free men who were at the top of a given society. So in a Jewish society, they would be the religious leaders um, and the other free, you know, like politically powerful men. And then you'd have a, a descending hierarchy of men, you know, down to the poor men. Then you'd on within that sort of equality sphere, you'd have in-group, but then the next you know, sort of equals would be out-group men. So if you're a Roman citizen, you know, you would still give more regard to a free king of a, a barbarian than you would to your own slaves. So this is the sort of dimensions I'm thinking of. So we have this group of free men, in-group and out-group men, and then below them are their property, their slaves, their women, and their children. If we think about it, women and women's bodies have always been regulated by men who ruled their communities, either with using religious justifications as we have in monotheism or the state. Women's bodies were regulated in terms of where they could go. For instance, women were not allowed to be in the Roman Senate. Women are not, were not allowed to go past per, certain parts of the temple in Jerusalem because they weren't pure enough. And what women could wear was also heavily regulated. We have this in Deuteronomy. The woman shall not wear that which pertains to a man, 
because you want a distinction between men and women so you know who was your inferior and who was your superior. And even in Paul, there's talking about covering a woman's head and when she should and shouldn't cover her head. And he writes that a man ought not to cover his head since he is the image and the glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. And this mentality toward men and women's relations and their power relations was um, became you know, continued on through um, Christianity and through the Middle Ages. And while women were, we got rid of slavery, kind you know legally, we still have human trafficking into slavery, but legal structures around slavery were eliminated and replaced by feudalism. Women increasingly have gained more rights over time. Women's bodies have always been, and still are, regulated by the state. And these regulations are heavily influenced by religious norms in ways that men's bodies are not. Women's bodies are regulated to protect men from exposure to women's bodies. And this is the, I think, where the real feminist critique allows an incisive view of these power relations. Women's bodies aren't covered in order to protect women from other women. <laughs> They're basically a way to baby-proof the world so that men can not have so many sexual thoughts. <laughs> and so covering women's bodies in order to protect them from other men seeing them is a way to demonstrate ownership. Women's bodies were seen as property. They were literally sometimes sold off into marriage or into slavery. And they were then the property of their husbands or masters or when they weren't the property of their fathers. So this notion of regulating women's bodies to protect men from seeing them and having sexual thoughts about them is still with us today. We have a free the movement nipple, which gets mocked. But the truth is, if you just have two close-ups of nipples, you can't tell a male nipple from a female nipple. You need the contextualized image of the woman's body to know whether or not that's offensive. And some states consider lewd behavior to take your shirt off. So why focus on the burqa? My objection to the burqa is based entirely in feminist critique because it singles out women for oppression. Now the burqa itself is not Islamic, it's cultural. And therefore my critique is not anti-Islamic and I'm not here to bash on Islam. I'm only engaging in a feminist critique in this discussion. I also don't object to the burqa for reasons of like national or local security. Some people say that you should have the burqa because the state should be able to see everyone's face to identify them. Um, but my, but that again, is not the interest that I'm going to be speaking to today. My critique is based on a few observations. First and foremost, wearing the burqa is an entirely gendered practice. And the word gendered came up, I noticed, with your discussion in, with bearing. And I think it's important to point out that the word gendered just means it happens to one sex more than another. <laughs> That's it. If something is gendered, it just it more than women or women do it more than men. And the burqa is a gendered practice. Its goal is supposed to be purportedly one of modesty. But modesty is a concept that applies equally to men or women. Women have sexual thoughts as well, yet men are not required to cover themselves to the extent women are, and they certainly aren't required to wear a burqa. This critique allows us to highlight this hypocrisy by examining the inadequate and the inequalities between the sexes that feminism brings to our understanding of society. So I'm not, for instance, in favor of the state banning everything that covers the face or head because both men and women wear head coverings. This is why the burqa ends up becoming a special case. Men can have a do-rag or a cancer patient might want to cover their head because of hair loss after cancer treatment. But we really can't say the same for the burqa. It's designed to be worn by women only. Second, my feminist critique, critique focuses on the intent of the burqa. It's really aimed to negate the personhood of a woman. It's an attempt to eliminate a woman's physical body from who she is. Who were the forerunners of the burqa could have created a black, blackout square box like we put over people's eyes in photos to hide their identity. I have no doubt they would have done that. If they could have made it practical for a woman to walk around in a box, I think they would have, because it's, um, it's a display for them of who owns that woman's body, and it's not her. My third feminist critique of the burqa is that it punishes women for men's thoughts. The men in these ancient societies decided it was easier to cover up women's bodies and cast them as dangerous temptations rather than address the problem of rampant sexism or misogyny in their own cultures. Instead of promoting the idea that men in those societies act like grown-ups, which men are perfectly capable of doing, teaching their boys to respect women, 
they baby-proof their world by punishing women for men's sexual thoughts. So those were sort of my prepared remarks, and then I have um, some other issues that I will bring up uh, over the course of the discussion if necessary, but it seems like that's a good place to stop and get some reaction from you guys. Yeah, absolutely. And one thing that especially stuck out to me was uh, kept saying baby, baby proof. And the really sick thing about this is there was a Saudi cleric who declared that baby girls need to be put into a baby sized burqa. Otherwise, they might tempt the males around them. So that's fucking sick. Yeah, and that's sick. I mean, it's not even just about the oppression of women at that point. It's also just a direct insult to every fucking man in the vicinity of that motherfucker's voice. Excuse my strong language. Because men are just mindless fucking dogs, right? And I mean, that's an insult to mindless dogs. It assumes all men are rapists. Yeah. This so so world for you. Garbage. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, so um, so there, there's there's one point of contention I have with it that it's not just about you know women. It's it also af is offensive to fucking men. And um, I, again, I'm not entirely sold on banning the freedom of expression in in Western countries. Um, obviously, that's not a thing in uh, theocracies, in Muslim theocracies, where where th these things are common. But um, there is quite an argument to be made against this being a feminist movement, just wearing the burqa in solidarity or whatever. I think it's, it's, it's gross and racist because there are literally women who are suffering because they have to wear it and you're wearing it in solidarity with them. That's fucking idiotic. So I don't know how, how a good argument for wearing the burqa could possibly be made, although I don't know that there could be a good one made to ban it, legally speaking. Well, I mean, what I would say is, again, with the caveat that in America, because of the First Amendment, it would never go through, but you have seen it in France, for instance. Yeah. Um, I think the, the reason why I th it is worth carving out for a special exemption, again, is it, because it goes back to the cultural practices that so disproportionately reduce women's autonomy. And my argument would be that we've seen shifts in the law since the 1970s when women began to agitate about domestic abuse issues. That it used to be that you had to press charges if there was an incident of domestic violence. Or police would have discretion and they wouldn't have to arrest anyone. And it was recognized that because of the patterns of abuse in an abusive relationship, the abuser often controls the finances, they control, the, they get to control who the person has access to. And so if it's a case of a woman being beaten by a man, she might not be in a position of equality to press charges the way you would if you say got mugged by someone mm -hmm. because of the intimate relationship. And so what states did was they took that decision out of the hands of the victim and said if there's a call for domestic violence and someone has been, you can observe that someone has been hit, you have to make an arrest. And it took it out of her hands or in the case of where men were the victims out of the man's hands and the state prosecuted the person. So the, you know, the, the, there was a recognition there that the person didn't have the power to make that decision. Yeah. And I think for, for areas where women are wearing the burqa, where it's community, where there are cultural pressures, they don't have the, their autonomy. They don't have the choice in their own homes to say, I don't want to wear the burqa. But if the state comes in and eliminates the burqa, they can still wear other kinds of conservative clothing. There are other options out there. But this one thing that is really a symbol of negating her humanity to reduce her to just a black blob and a voice um, to make her afraid of showing her face or make her afraid of being seen always as a piece of meat to every single man on the street because that is the paradigm in which the Berka operates. And I think that's enough of an intervention. It necessitates state intervention there to balance out an inequality. And that would be my argument why the law in the case of the Berka would be needed. Okay. Yeah, um, that's... Certainly a sound argument, and we, we, we should make the distinction that the hijab is just the, the head covering, the niqab is actually the face veil, and the burqa is the, the, the whole outfit everyone's familiar with. Um, so, do you have a problem with the hijab? 
again, I don't, I mean, I personally do, but the thing is that when it comes down to a legal matter, it has to be applicable to both genders and it has to be applied fairly. So you couldn't ban the hijab and then not ban the do-rag, you know, because that's not fair. But this, this is why I think the burqa is a very special case because it's entirely gendered and it's, it's designed to maintain a power relation, an un unequal and unfair and pathological power relation, in my opinion. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay, so, so how would you go about, or what countries would you say uh, legal arguments could be made for, for, for banning the burqa, aside from obviously France, it's a very contentious issue because, again, I think there is a conflation of the burqa and Islam. And when I looked into it, I'll actually provide a, uh, a source that I found, but it just goes through the ways in which the burqa has actually been opposed by men in the Muslim world um, back like in the 1940s. Um, I've got this story of a guy who was so disgusted by them, like he took one and burned it. Um, he was later kicked out of his country, Iran, I think. And, uh, yeah, and this guy in Afghanistan, a guy, a guy named Shah Khan, in, who I guess was the Shah from 1919 to 1929, um, scandalized the Persians by permitting his wife to go unveiled. In 1928, he urged Afghan women to uncover their faces and advocated the shooting of interfering husbands. He said that he would himself supply the weapons for this and that no inquiries would be instituted against the women. Once, when he saw a woman wearing a burqa in the Kabul garden, he tore it off and burned it. However, he was exiled and the country was plunged back into the past. So again, I, I, there's a conflation of the culture and the religion and people then extend this to a religious belief and religious practice when it, within Islam, it doesn't seem, it's not, um, it certainly doesn't seem to be a clear answer that women have to wear the burqa. In fact, it seems to be the opposite. So. Okay, because but which countries would you say would be practical to enact laws against the wearing of this cultural phenomenon that is anti-woman? I would imagine that most states outside of, well, again, um, I'm not a legal expert on this. So this is the other thing, too, I guess I should say, because uh, I think it's worth saying because I'm, I'll get comments about this forever. This is an opinion I hold. This isn't like something that's a deep issue of activism to me, but it's one where I am, I've said by my liberal friends and I tend to disagree. <laughs> and their disagreement has forced me to come up with better arguments and understand my own position better. Um, but I'm not going to be making videos on this. I'm not going to be doing, you know, a, a bunch of advocacy on this. And I know there are going to be people out there saying, you know, why don't you make a video on banning the burqa? And my answer would be, why don't you make a video on banning the burqa? Um, I, I'm willing to have it as a discussion, but in terms of like actually seeing it happening, it obviously was very controversial in France, and it makes a lot of people very uncomfortable because of the way that it's framed in liberal democracies. But so my goal was really just to put out what I thought was a, a reasonable humanist feminist critique yeah. of the issue, um, more so than trying to advance any particular uh, political agenda. So certainly, yeah. certainly, and and for the record, this is a video about banning the burqa. Yeah. <laughs> so check that off the list, and uh, um, yeah, I, I don't. <laughs> as far as how it makes people uh, uncomfortable, I don't care like it's not about making people uncomfortable it's about solidarity with people who are actually suffering not just your fucking discomfort here in the west you know so um i don't know i, I guess a parallel could be made to microchips how they microchip women in saudi arabia uh they're literally property and uh just slaves they're literally fucking slaves and um domestic slaves domestic servants unpaid domestic servants Unpaid domestic servants who can get beaten to death for disobeying their masters. Unpaid domestic servants who get, can get beaten for disobeying the masters who get microchipped and have to wear a rag over their entire body. And you forgot raped. Uh, well, that should go without saying. Uh, yes, so anyway. Um, but I God think forbid think... you get raped. Otherwise, you know, the Sharia courts will go ahead and whip you into shape. You, the victim, <laughs> for inciting uh, indecent conduct. I, it's definitely an issue that touches uh, women who are affected by it, and those women live all around the world, you know, um, except obviously now in France where 
it's it's bam bam but um yeah it, it's a to me it's the most potent symbol of patriarchy that we have in modern society um, and that's because it, it goes right back to a time where patriarchy was just assumed to be the norm and now, now we're challenging that through feminist activism so um yeah, yeah it's I, a, I don't see how anybody could possibly um like argue with the existence of patriarchy when we're talking about places like Saudi Arabia. They're like, patriarchy? Pshaw! <laughs> what is this buzzword, Central? Motherfucker, do you not know words? <laughs> That's very true. But, and, but also I think that what the discussion should also have us do, because I, I notice this myself as you know, I tend to, uh, to focus on the burqa in, and then I was doing all this analysis of you know, this, the power of the state in regulating women's bodies. And we can say to, we want to contrast it with the West, where we feel like women are entirely liberated and bearing again, you know, asked questions about what laws are there that women aren't equal to men. But the fact is that we are a bit blind to the way that we currently regulate women's bodies, whether it's breastfeeding in public or whether it's you know, women going topless and that be considered a lewd act in some states in the US. Now, nudity is laws vary across country, but there are certainly, in the states at least, it's a much more puritanical place, and uh, breasts are highly sexualized, even though they're really designed for babies. <laughs> um, and so women's bodies, even though it's not to the extreme of a burqa, you still have a disproportionate amount of state governance over women's bodies, whether that be through contraceptive act access and abortion access, or through um, how they can dress in public. Definitely. And I don't know if you've heard of Mona El Tahawi. We, we have a video of hers up on our channel that we put up a, a while ago now. And she, she's actually a Muslim who is uh, just fervently against against face veils. So that's food for thought. And, and we, we, we did link that in the description. Um, basically, all the ex-Muslims that we featured on the channel uh, and liberal Muslims who we featured on the channel who agree with this dance. So it isn't you know, Westerners talking about this and leaving the Eastern voices mute. Like I said, we, we try to have some people on, but for very unfortunate reasons, they are literally not capable of joining us live. Right. Uh, but in, in terms of, again, that sort of reflecting to our own societies, um, you know, again, we I think we can feel some sense of moral superiority because we don't have a society where the re requiring uh, wearing a burqa is is required. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't constantly be questioning the way women's bodies are portrayed in society, and used and objectified, and 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 reflect back on what about that patriarchal tradition are we still drawing upon, and are we still using to inform our lives, even though we claim to be secular and atheist, um, you know, how much of the, the echo of those traditions are still deep within our unconscious minds when we look at, um, yeah, women and the way that women's bodies um, can or cannot be displayed in public. Mm -hmm. Do you still believe that, I mean, this is a bit off topic at this point, but I, I promised we promised people that we would ask you some questions as we yeah, have. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so do you still believe that feminism is the only lens in which to view biological and historical study? No, that's never what I said. Um, what I said that is if you want to understand society with paying a particular attention to how men and women or how, either as individuals or as a group operate, that's a feminist critique. So it's not saying you know, I can do Marxist analysis of class issues and not use feminist theory at all, or you can look at things through a capitalist lens, or you can look at things through a Freudian lens. There's a lot of different theoretical constructs, but if you talk about the id and the ego and the superego, you're going to be using Freud. If you talk about macroevolution and microevolution, you're going to be using the theory of evolution. And if you're looking at power relations between men and women based on gendered norms or practices, that's feminist critique. So that was that was what I was trying to convey in that exchange. Mm. Thank you for a very good question, whoever it was. Yeah. So there seems to be some confusion from the Sargon debate when you mentioned it being legal in Oklahoma to rape a sleeping person's mouth. Would you care to elaborate on that one exactly? 
Yeah, I would recommend people go to Google and do Mother Jones, Oklahoma, oral rape. And there's a story there about the appellate court that decided that a boy, or I guess, well, yeah, he was, I guess, technically a boy, he's 17 at the time, had been charged with a crime that um, was, uh, was uh, rape, but because the victim was unconscious, there was basically a gap in the law. And the gap in the law was that it would be sexual battery if you didn't consent, and if the person didn't consent and you penetrated them orally or anally or whatever else, but it didn't include being too intoxicated to give consent. And then the rape law um, had intoxication, but it didn't include oral penetration. So there was basically a gap in the law, and they tried to prosecute him for one of those crimes, and the appellate court said you can't extend the meaning of the statute to include something it doesn't include. So he was released. He was basically let off for doing that. And that was um, what I had pointed out in the debate and which I had actually provided a link for in the description box below. And I know that there is a, um, an attempt to say that I was misrepresenting it or lying, it, lying about that, but really just go read the Mother Jones articles where they quote the attorneys who were involved with the case. Okay. All right, well, thank you. We appreciate it. Well, yeah. Hopefully that clears it up um, for people who are confused on your position and the information you provided on both of those um, questions. Uh, the, the last one that we have here is um, basically just the same one that we had for Steve Shives and, and Bering uh, the day before. What advice can you give to young people who have been wanting to become vocal about being a feminist or that are afraid of all the backlash that happens to vocal feminists online? Oh, fantastic. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Let me get comfortable. Sure. All right. So this is what, this might be a bit of a long answer, but I think we've got a bit of time and we seem to have exhausted the burqa thing because we agreed. So <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just go with it. A little bit of background, just I will get to the answer, but I, I started off my channel making atheist content, but it was always my intention to make atheist content from a feminist perspective because I see religious patriarchy as a major problem in society. I think we have a huge religious patriarchy hang, hangover that still permeates our society today. As recently as Donald Trump saying that if his daughter was sexually harassed at a company, he would expect her to change careers or leave the company, not to fix the culture of the company. Like that's just anyway. So so we have these norms that are still very much with us that are grounded in these Bronze Age worldviews. And when I had the atheist content, it was all fine. I just collected people who were, you know, happy to see more atheist content. And I did biblical critique. And that didn't seem to, that was fine too. Like if I was criticizing the Bible using feminist theory, that seemed to go over okay. But when I started to make more feminist content, then I started to get some pushback. So if you're interested in making uh, feminist content, from my own experience, this is what I would say. You have, my approach to my YouTube channel is that it's like my house. And that if I'm having a party and people get loud and rowdy, I'll tolerate to a point. But if you piss me off, I will just kick you out of my house. <laughs> and so, you know, you don't have to, there's no, no law that says you have to let people on your channel who say horrible things about you. This is your channel. It's your space. And I tend to do more on the side of letting debate happen, but I have lines. I will not let people call me a cunt and I won't let that stuff stand on my page. Um, if you want to call someone else a cunt, that's fine. Like, I'm not going to censor the word cunt because of cunt, but I'm not going to have you using it to, or if you say, oh, Chrissy, you're such a lovely cunt, and you mean it, I mean, you're my friend. This is it, you're my friend. I will know that, and I will not, you know, take that comment off. But people who want to use sexual slurs to demean me, I'm not going to stand for that. There's no, you have no right to say that to my face, and I just have to put up with your shit. So that's my approach to it. If you don't want to deal with comments, just turn your comments off. The problem with turning your comments off is that there's a great community that you won't get to know. So you have to kind of take the rough with the smooth. There are ways to filter out certain slurs like slut and cunt and other things so that you have to moderate those comments rather than them just going up there. And then you can deal with people who don't respect you and don't have arguments. But the most important thing about it that I would say is when you, if you have a feminist video up, this is what I do. When I have a feminist video up, when I go to look at the comments, I kind of have to put on my don't have no fucks left to give armor, <laughs> which is I read it, and if someone is just pouring bile on me, I don't give a shit what they say. I mean, they don't have an argument. So I, I don't have to respect their opinion, and I certainly don't have to take it personally. 
So sometimes if they're dumb, I'll mock them. Some, if they're vicious, I'll you know delete them or block them. Um, but there are great people out there who leave fantastic comments. And those are the people I connect with and I chat to. If I have honest questions, I will interact with them. But don't be afraid of the haters because they can stand there and bark at you, but they're not going to bite. People have lines. They do have respect. And, you know, uh, I know that there are some cases of, you know, like Anita Sarkeesian who's gotten death threats. If you're a minor channel on YouTube, that's really not going to happen. And if it does, you should report it. There is a reporting system. YouTube is starting to take these things more seriously. And there is a way you can report a channel that's abusing you with, you know, like uh, death threats or report comments. So um, it is not, it's a, it can be a bit rough and tumble. But if you are too afraid to speak up, then they win. And that's the most important thing is if they silence your voice, then that's one last voice that's an ally to a movement that you care about. And don't let, don't let your fear of people whose opinions you sh don't have to respect anyway because they don't have good arguments, silence you. And I've been dogpiled by Sargon, you know, as, and I've documented it. And it went on for like a day. And it was basically a, like a denial of service because every time I went to Twitter, I just had a wall of the sexually explicit comments being thrown back at me. Um, but if the dragon breathes fire on you, once you realize that the dragon really can't hurt you, then you can look at it more objectively. And if it's sexual harassment or if it's dogpiling, if they're violating the terms of service, then treat it like that. But again, if they silence you because you're afraid of what they might say in the comments, then they've won. Don't let them win. Get your voice out there. You have a freedom of speech. Use it. Please use it. Yeah, very, very well said. Uh, we are inclined to agree on really every point you made. So um, while I, I'm, I'm trying to see if we really do completely agree on the burqa thing, going back to that, um, while we're opposed to female, female face veiling basically with every sinew of our bodies, um, but we wouldn't support a ban on the grounds of personal liberty uh you would or no no i don't think um when it beyond the sort of like full full clothing you know basically a blackout of a human being uh, I, the law has to be able to be applied to everybody fairly so for me you know if you're you've got your hair cut you, you might do that because you like wearing that scarf that day. I don't know. And I don't think it's a state's business um, right. in that case. So it's really yeah, difficult. But, 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 but you would stand for legal banning of, of like the full burqa, right? Yeah, I wouldn't. I would have no problem with that at all. Okay. Well, and, and I mean, we're not policymakers. So it's yeah. not like our opinion matters. But yeah, exactly. I can't vote on this in any meaningful way. We're not forcing our opinions on anybody, but we would also support that, I think. And um, are, am I right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just on the basis of uh, being anti-segregation, I think. And, yes, gender um, apartheid. Any kind of on, uh, male-only or female-only spaces are a type of segregation. And in the case of like shelters, I guess there's arguments that could be made for that. But um, aside from that, and certainly in the public space, segregation should be completely illegal. Um, especially, and I mean, it's worse than, than ethnic segregation because it's by, it's by sex, which is half the human fucking population. So it, it's, it's that much worse than say a black only uh, drinking fountain or something, because this is, this is expected of all women, right? And so, yeah. I, Totally I think yes. it might be a good time to bring up the article that we shared that was going around um, recently. Yep. Please do. You wanna, do you want to talk about it? No, by all, all right. means. All right. Well, it's you basically, wanna... yeah, somebody was documenting, um, I think there's a, I want to say she's Iranian, a woman in Iran, but I could be wrong because I watched it in a German news coverage and it, I, my German's not perfect. But anyway, there are men who are in Iran who have started taking, uh, putting the scarves on their head and taking selfies of themselves with their, their wives because their wives don't have a choice. They have to wear it. And their husbands or their brothers or their friends are standing with them in solidarity. I think it's another reason why it's really important not to, through bigotry, generalize to all Muslims. 
because there are Muslim men who understand the oppression that women in their, in their country, in Iran, are facing and are standing up and making a protest in solidarity with women that they shouldn't have to wear this thing all the time. So I think that that's important to recognize, you know, and also I have um, several Muslim, well, I've several co colleagues who have come from Muslim countries. And when we had our, our German class together, it was me and two or three of the other students in the class come from predominantly Muslim countries. But when we had our little section on religion, and we went around, what's your religion? And like, oh, I'm an atheist. I'm like, oh, I, don't, I might be the only atheist in the room. Everybody else was too. And the fact is that they couldn't say that they didn't believe in Islam when they lived in Iran, but when they moved to Germany and were able to not have to be required to follow the Muslim, you know, to be, to conform, they could be themselves. And they basically abandoned, you know, just like, I, my religion's not that important to me. I, I don't want to pay the tax, so I'm just going to declare myself an atheist, because in Germany, you can pay part of your tax every month to a religious institution or whatever. Um, and so, again, I think it's really important that we not generalize in our discussion when we talk about Muslims, because there are a lot of Muslims who are, who agree with us. And when you make the world black and white, you make enemies out of your own allies. So a little bit of nuance, guys. A little bit of nuance goes a long way. Now, you said you can pay part of your taxes in Germany, or you have to if you're in a religion? What happens is, well, when I was, for instance, I got my work permit, and I was filling out the various forms, they have an area where you can declare for church tax. So if you are, say, Catholic, you can have part of your money, um, part of your paycheck every month. This is, again, very weird to Americans. But the state will collect it and transfer it over to the Catholic whatever body that collects the money. And there's a Protestant one and Muslim one and everyone else. But you can also just declare as atheist to get away with not paying it. Most people pay it because if you want to have a church service, you've had to pay your, your church tax to have access to those religious services. But I think as we get more and more secular services, you know, people um, will will stop doing that. And religiosity is much lower in East Germany for all these reasons than it is in the West. Um, but uh, there's still, and, and yeah, it's, it's not a, a massively religious country. Well, I live in Cologne where our gay pride festival or parade day is awesome and a lot of fun. And um, yeah, they're the kind of, kind of, at least, you know, I'm sure there are people who are probably very devout pr privately, but publicly Cologne is more about the, the feasting parts of the Catholic holidays you know, or the, the five day build up to Ash Wednesday, where we just basically the city shuts down because everyone is in costume by nine o'clock in the morning, dressed up as bumblebees or ghostbusters or um, the, uh, Captain Jack Sparrow drinking Kolsch from nine in the morning and then just going all day. And then we do that for party five city. days in a row. It's totally a party city. Yeah. So they're all about like the feasting part of the Catholic stuff. Um, but it is interesting because again, this is a tangent, but so we have carnival, which starts the Thursday. Well, it starts in November before Ash Wednesday, but it kind of starts um, officially five days before the start of Lent. And you have five, you know, Thursday night, Thursday starts, then you have drinking Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. We also have a big parade on Monday. It's called Rose Monday. And then Tuesday is the last day. And by then you can't really drink anymore. But at midnight on Tuesday, there's a ritual where all the local pubs will have this. What will happen is uh, people will go to the pubs and they'll have a big straw person, like an effigy, and it's called the nubal. And what you do is you put all your sins on the nubal. So you might say, oh, I drank away my rent money during carnival. It's the nubal's fault. Or I kissed my best friend's wife a couple of times. It's the nubal's fault. So everyone piles their sin on the nubal, and then they sing a song, and they take the nubal out, and they put him in the road, and they set him on fire. And all your sins are burned away. <laughs> you can start Lent <laughs> without it's, it's a scapegoating. It is literally the process of scapegoating. Exactly, yeah. It's the old true. ancient ritual. Yeah. And uh, I, I, I watched them carry on. It's all Nubal's fault. <laughs> <It's all Nubel. laughs> yeah. So, uh, well, not to laugh at that joke, but yeah. Um, <clears throat> what, or... I don't know, joke, maybe somebody does that. I don't know. Um, yeah. Trying Sounds to really, get back to the, to the topic a little bit. Yeah, yeah, sorry. We got off on a really, I think it's a cool tangent because I just think these ancient kind of oh, practices yeah. still yeah, definitely. brought in the 21st century, you know, we do them because they're fun, not because they, you know, their original meaning. So, yeah. 
Uh, yeah, just elbow me in the face. It's fine. <laughs> I can take it. I'm. It's not what I deserve. But I, I'm the wait. I'm, uh, so how does condemning? Okay. No. Yeah. All right, all right. So so for those who are new, will definitely say that um, these kind of conversations about controlling cultures and being interventionalist and having an opinion, uh, having an ethical stance even, is uh, playing right into terrorist hands. Our response to that, our official TSF-approved response is, how does condemning Islamism play into terrorist hands? And are moderate Muslim a sentence away from terrorism, in, in your analogy? Because that would be fucking bigotry. Like the moment that somebody says something bad about Islam or the culture they're in associated, then we're playing into terrorist hands. I've heard this argument uh, countless times and it's fucking insane. Like I've, I've heard it, I think from the president of the United States. We cannot play into their hands. How the fuck are you playing into their hands? Is this a rhetorical Unless question? you're literally <laughs> on the verge of violence. What's that? Yeah, I was taking this as a rhetorical question, not uh, yes, one yes, directed yeah, no, at you. Okay. not actually directed at you, of course. Okay. I'm just, I'm going off on a tangent of my own because I'm sick of this fucking argument. And uh, thoughts on that at all? Well, my, my one thought would be is that when people speak in a black and white language and pit the West against Islam, I think that is playing into the terrorist hands because that's the territory they want to play on. They want to make the world black and white. And I think it takes... Uh, a more sophisticated and mature mind and also a more tactical mind to basically divide and conquer. You know, um, that's what, you gotta take a sort of page out of Karl Rove's you know, playbook here and you need to get moderate and secular Muslims on side. And you don't do that by using really broad brush strokes. So claims that, you know, if you criticize one thing, people are gonna react against you. Yeah, some assholes might. But I'm not worried about those particular people. I think one of the things I find rather frustrating, for instance, like with your conversation with Baring, is he said, oh, I saw feminists saying things and I'm therefore I'm anti-feminist. Well, that's just like, that's, no. I'm, I mean, feminism is a, it's, it's an ideology, it's a theory, it's, it's a form of, of activism. It can inform your activism. It's, it's not just enough to, that would be like saying, I saw an American on television and he was being a crazy jerk because he had red, he had orange face and he was, you know, insulting a, a military family who had, had lost a son. All Americans are asshole. It, it, the world doesn't work like that. Just because a few people identify as feminists and say stupid things does not mean that feminism is a stupid thing. Feminism is a set of ideas, critique the ideas. If you want to critique people, name names and not say feminists. Um, because I think people should be held account for their own words and actions, quote them, you know, um, but don't then broad brush stroke an entire group of people who might disagree with that person as being part of the problem. So, yeah, I think Islam, like any other idea, is up for criticism because that's our right as human beings. We come up with these ideas so we get to analyze them and take them apart and support them or, you know, oppose them. That's our right. Um, so, yeah, if it's supposed to be like, controlling our speech because we are unable to criticize anything re remotely related to Islam because of fear of terrorism. I just think that's a ridiculous argument. Absolutely. Uh, what, what about the inevitable claim that we're Islamophobic for caring about the people who suffer under theocracy? It's hard to get inside the head of people I, I, who I think what, what my guess is, if I'm going to be charitable here, is that they're very well-meaning and that a lot of people have not taken the time to understand an issue like the burqa and think about it from a theoretical point of view. They tend to see news items and they might, for instance, be able to differentiate that you know the burqa is an issue in Afghanistan, it's not an issue in Iran. Iran has other issues, but they might just feel uncomfortable with um, generalized criticisms of Islam, maybe because you know they don't have it, they don't know anyone who's Muslim, and they feel like they aren't well placed to judge a legitimate critique from a bad critique, and therefore they err on the side of caution and non-bigotry. They're basically well-meaning, 
they're just kind of well-meaning without knowing enough. Because I think if someone does spend time thinking about your principles, especially if you're, you know, a humanist, but from any position, just human dignity, just the basic Geneva Convention kind of universal declaration of human rights, and think about issues um, on their merits. And if a, a religion has a good practice, it should be able to defend that practice within the context of human rights. So I think that that's the, the way we should be having this debate. And I think, yeah, I think there are people who probably are trying to be well-meaning, but what they end up doing is excusing practices that they actually would oppose had they given them more thought. Well, and you see, and I think not giving these things thought is a type of bigotry in and of itself, even though they accuse others of bigotry for actually caring enough to talk about it, because they, they don't feel like it's their place. Okay, fine, but you silencing the conversation is a type of racism in my mind because they, they're they literally like, oh, well, it's their culture, so we should let them hash it out. It's not our place to say anything. How is it not everyone's place to say something when there are human rights abuses? How is that not racist to be silent? That's my position on it. And, and I mean, if we're Islamophobic, we're Islamophobic in the same way that we're misogynophobic. Like a phobia is an irrational fear and well, we're not afraid. We're angry. We're angry. Yeah, we're angry. <laughs> is, it, yeah. is it irrational to be more concerned about Islam than like Mormonism or something? I, don't, I think so. I think that's fair to say. The moment that Mormonism rises to the top of, you know, the most violence committed in the name of a theocracy, then we'll worry about that more. But treating every religion as if it's equal, they're all equally wrong, but they're, they don't all equally act equally wrong and that's an important distinction that people just refuse to make on the basis of that kind of soft pretend not bigotry i would agree that uh, sort of just um going back to cultural relativism is lazy it's intellectually lazy and again it might come down might come down to not knowing or thinking through your own morals and values because yeah i mean i don't think that there's an objective morality but i can give a damn good reason for every moral principle i hold that's based not only in logic, but also in some kind of human compassion. And I'm willing to have that debate with somebody, you know, about why women shouldn't wear the burqa because it, it, it um, negates their human dig dignity. Um, but I also think that, you know, it is also too easy sometimes to shake our finger at Islam and then not say anything about polygamy cults in the U.S. where we can do something about it or legislation that allows girls who are pregnant and 14 year old to marry the guy who got them pregnant. Yeah, yeah. These are problems in our own backyard. We shouldn't be so busy, you know, pointing our finger at other people that we forget that there is activism that can be done and should be being done today. And I know you guys are very active in, in your own ways and on things you care about. Um, so we should not ignore the problems in our own backyard and pat ourselves on the back for not being as barbaric as people who are much closer to those Bronze Age views are. We have our own barbarism. It's just harder. We don't see it. Agreed. Agreed. And it's not, um, you know, these, these things get dismissed as, oh, you worried about first world problems. Well, no, we're worried about all the world's problems, including the ones happening in our own backyard, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So I think, I think it is disingenuous to, to only criticize other people. And that's a fair point. Um, so, you know, we strive not to, not to only do that. We strive to, make change wherever we can. And obviously it's much easier to do closer to home. Um, and that's what we strive to do. Uh, there's a lot of things that need to be fixed in the first world and, or in the Western world or whatever you want to call it. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we need to be silent about atrocities happening elsewhere either. So I think yeah. it's important to both. And, and the problem is that some people are just, I don't know, maybe too lazy. <laughs> it's, it's really frustrating that they will yeah. moralize us, but then they won't, they're, they, they're not doing anything, you know? Yeah, they'll be outraged in the comments about child brides in Afghanistan and not realize that there are states in the, in the U.S. and thousands of, you know, there's a, the activism of uh, the National Organization of Women in New York who are trying to get work on issues of, of child marriage. And not just girls getting married, but child marriage, you know, not to, talking about gender inclusive legislation, not just singling out girls for this, but also protecting boys. That's what feminists do. Um, so, uh, yeah, yeah, on that issue. I also, you know, one of the reasons I don't, well, the main reason I don't make videos on Islam is I just don't know enough about it to properly 
criticize it. Like I don't, I would take me so much time and effort, you know, and I only have so much in the day. But I do sometimes get people who will say, why don't you make videos critical of Islam? And I'm really suspicious of them because I don't think they're interested in me doing a video critical of Islam and women because they're interested in my academic pain. I think they're looking for hate watching stuff. They just want to see people crap on Islam, but this time do it in the name of women. And I see this also when um, you have terrorist attacks that are initially thought maybe to have an Islamic or Muslim radical you know, connection, and then it turns out to be a mental health issue, and then you just drop it. Or the way that they only care about rape when they think there are, there are rape gangs in Germany, which is a total fucking lie, by the way. Um, there are not rape gangs. And you know, I lived in Cologne, and, and they, I, there was not mass rape in Cologne either. There were multiple rapes, and there was a mass sex attack. From my investigation, I can only find three um, people who filed rape charges after the New Year's attack. And yet this has been worked up into gang rapes or, or mass rape gangs um, patrolling Germany. And so I, I oftentimes, you know, end up not, I resi I'm resistant to do videos critical of Islam because I don't think it would be the content that they would want, uh, A, because they're not interested in, in what I really have to say. They just want to watch somebody shit on it. And two, uh, it would just be so much work that I wouldn't get a lot of other videos done in the meantime. So that's why I know you guys are, have a, it's an issue you care about and you've studied and you've talked to people and you've listened and you're becoming experts on. And I'm really glad that we have the diversity of interest in our little group of, you know, feminists here on YouTube where Everyone does have the things that they care about, and because we all bring what we care about to the plate, you know, to the table, we all learn from each other. And I think that's really good about our, our little corner of YouTube. Yeah, definitely. Um, we're, uh, we'll make the same offer to you uh, as we did to Steve Shives. If you're interested, we can connect you to some uh, liberal or ex-Muslims who can uh, educate you when, whenever you have time. And... Um, yeah, if it comes up for a video where I need to defer to someone who knows way more than me, I will get in contact with you guys. Okay. And uh, for, for the audience in the chat, uh, what states marry children in the United States? From the video that I did, I know that they were working on legislation. I want to say it was, one was New Jersey. I don't know. There's, I have a video about this. So go to my channel, plug for me. And it's um, called like Child Brides in the U.S. I have a playlist that's called Feminism. And all of my personal, all the videos I make are in the feminism playlist. And then I have another playlist called Responses to Anti-Feminist. And in that playlist, I just put anybody's content that I come across that is responding to anti-feminists. But the Child Bride video is definitely in the feminist um, playlist. And I, I made it like three months ago. So I don't want, I would rather have you guys go watch it than for me to get it wrong. But I, I do know, for instance, that um, the National Organization of Women in New York uh, have a web, web page because they were working on a legislative bill that was trying to fix that problem. I understand. I understand. And uh, thank you very much for clarifying that. So everybody, go to Chrissy's channel. Check that. Uh, check yeah, that. go to my channel. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, well, I, that's really all the questions and comments that we had prepared. So. Um, would you like to wrap it up or would you like to try and steer it into a, a new direction or how would you like to go about this? Well, as, as much as I'm enjoying this and I'm really enjoying this, can I take a rain check? Cause I just picked up a friend from the airport and I've sure. uh, been um, hanging out with you guys instead of uh, him. So I've been, I've had uh, a lot of people coming through and using my couch here and, and using, take, availing themselves of it. So yeah, I'm going to go back and play hostess to uh, my friend for a bit. So yeah, we've gone for about an hour and I think that that's a, a reasonable amount of time. This is really great and I'm so glad we did it and I would love to do it again in the not too distant future. Absolutely. Uh, thank you very much, Christy. Always a pleasure to have you on and you're always welcome back. I only oh, wish I could have been in the chat. I would have loved to see what my chat was like. <laughs> the chat uh -huh. for my show was like. <laughs> Hi, all you chatters. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, everyone, for joining us. And thank you, Christy, once again. Bye-bye.